For a moment, imagine yourself in a day which starts out apparently like any other day. You wake, go downstairs and pour your cornflakes, or Weetabix, or make your toast and a cup of tea. As you sip and munch and shake away the sleep, you begin to realise that things around you are eerily different. You can't work out how, but there's something odd about today. The people you live with are acting weird. They seem nervous and rushed as they hurry you to finish your cereal. We've got to be on time today, they say. Strange, you think, but ask nothing more of it, returning upstairs to shower and to your room to dress. Here, you encounter more oddness. Laid out on your bed are a set of new clothes, a strangely coordinated outfit that you've never worn before. You put it on, noting its strange itchiness, and head back downstairs. Come on, says one of the people you live with. We've got to get going. They bustle you out of the door and down the street, hurrying you along until you arrive at a foreboding building, into which others like you are being hustled. At the door, a particularly tall woman is greeting and instructing. Good morning, she says. Somehow she knows your name. You get the impression that she must be in charge, some kind of leader. As you pass through the doorway, the person you live with says goodbye. Is that a tear in their eye? And then they are gone, and you're left in the strange containment room, with all of the others who have been bustled away this morning. Now then, says the leader, if you could come along to this area, you pick up a chair and bring it with you to the patch of carpet she indicates. No, the leader interrupts, here you need to sit on the floor. As you sit uneasily amongst the other bewildered souls, she draws up a chair for herself and begins what continues to be a strange and unpredictable day. You are read to and made to remain quiet and cross-legged and then sent to engage with activities which the leader has prepared for you. You find things odd during the day but with occasional senses of security. Areas and objects you find comfortably familiar. Now then, says the leader, don't hog those to yourselves, we share here, as other lost souls are ushered into your comfort zone. During the day there are strange routines. In the middle of the morning you are stopped and given fruit and milk. You're not hungry or thirsty, but the leader informs you this is what we do here. You're sat outside and told to exercise together, pulled back in to engage with more of the leader's whims and fancies. At lunch you're given a strange box, you see that others have opened there to access food and drink. You try to do the same, but find yourself unable to open it. Humiliated, you go to the leader to ask for help. In the afternoon is more of the same, until finally you are brought back to the strange carpet area. The person you live with arrives at the door, and you are taken away from that strange containment room and back to familiar surroundings of your home, with urgent questions. How was your day? What did you do? Did you miss me? You lie in bed that night, wide-eyed, as you turn over the events of that strange, disruptive day, thankful that it's ended, and you have returned to a place where everything makes sense. At least you think it's over. You're safe again, and won't have to go back to the leader and that strange containment room ever again. Reflect for a moment on your day. How would you feel? How would that influence how you behaved or experienced the world? Now compare this experience to that shared in the first week of September by any fictional five-year-old. He or she has spent their early days becoming something of an expert in the context they inhabit, the regimes and rhythms of the day, the rules that govern their behaviour. They've sussed the relationships that they inhabit, the people with whom they interact on a day-to-day -day basis, and what to expect of the universe as they know it. And then, everything is disrupted by the start of school. Here, everything is fundamentally different. Suddenly their lives are governed by an external timetable, a start and end of the day. The things that they must do, and the freedoms that they retain, are governed by instructions, down to when they must play and eat. Suddenly the small unit of people within which they must interact becomes diluted. They are in a place filled with other children, and adults who interact with them with care and duty, but who are not motivated by the same sense of affection and love that they find at home. The values of this new alien setting are fundamentally different. Their self-worth and purpose doesn't derive anymore from their ascribed status in the family, but from their performance in the classroom. No longer are they special because they are mummy and daddy's son or daughter, and instead because they have worked hard or done well. In short, everything is different, and they must learn to interact and behave in a whole new world. And of course, once they've acclimatised to this new environment, they are uprooted and move to a whole new one, making the transition from nursery to reception, from foundation stage to infants, juniors and beyond each shift bringing with it an entirely new universe of experience. In this session, we'll be concerned with just this kind of understanding, and in doing so, we'll draw heavily on the concept of culture. This term is used technically by sociologists to describe the ways in which behaviour is patterned in society. In basic terms, 
Culture represents the underlying rules which govern our expectations and actions, and which weld together a body of distinct individuals into a coherent whole. In the theory briefing sheet which accompanies this podcast, you'll find an exploration of the different components which make up culture. Here though, let's just treat it as a set of rules and beliefs which govern behaviours in different contexts and roles. Society as a whole has a culture then. There are things that we all share in common, commitments and principles, such as the right to life and opportunity, which direct things that are acceptable and unacceptable in day-to-day behaviour. This shared culture also legitimises some things over others, and therefore defines not just what is right and wrong, but also what is normal and abnormal. There is, however, also a degree of cultural diversity in our society. In talking about this, we often jump straight into the ways in which groups from different demographics, often ethnicity and class, have subtly different expectations of and commitments to the world. Sociologists call these formations within society subcultures. Children will come from these diverse subcultures and will therefore bring different expectations and experiences to the school with them. How we as teachers respond to this diversity is of course an important thing to consider. I think however that we can be a bit more subtle in how we think about cultural diversity. On one hand, Subcultural diversity is more complex than a simple consideration of ethnicity or social class. There is, for instance, as much difference amongst families of a particular ethnicity or social class as there are between them. There's a real risk of oversimplification here. Further, subcultures are not just demographic inventions. They exist spontaneously too, out of the ways in which individuals in society form themselves into groups. I am a secondary teacher by trade. I am used to the emo kids, the goths, the scallies and so on. All of these are also subcultural formations, and you'll find them spontaneously in primary schools as much as secondaries, albeit in a more subtle form. Here then, we have a nuance in the notion of cultural diversity. However, I'd like to add one more. Diversity stems not just from groupings in society, but also the institutions that they occupy. The kinds of norms and values which govern school, then, are fundamentally different to those which define the home, as I started to suggest in the opening chunk of this podcast. Again, you'll find more of this in the accompanying theory briefing sheet. For illustration here though, we could look at the expectation held of children. In the home, individuals are subject to particularistic standards. Rules are special and unique to them. At the school, however, children must rapidly learn to occupy universalistic standards. One set of rules and expectations applied to all children regardless of who they are. All of this involves a complex sense of negotiation. As young people learn to traverse two entirely different universes of meaning and expectation. I think that this lens offers an interesting alternative way of understanding transgressions from the culture of the school. Even within the general culture of school there's cultural diversity. The expectations of one classroom might be entirely different to another. How we organise our practice and the children within it then constructs an ethos or culture. It establishes routines and habits and communicates to children how they should behave what to expect of you, of the environment, of each other, and of themselves. In this session, I'm going to ask you to engage with and explore this notion of cultural diversity and how it might bring implications for your practice. You'll be encouraged to examine the notion of homeschool transitions and how this is mediated by the cultural diversities that children bring with them. Equally though, the session will focus on the culture you create in the classroom and how that in turn constructs a particular reality and experience which is entirely changeable.